So, as you probably heard, a MP called Graham Stringer took up the view of a professor of education at Durham University called Julian Elliott, who said that he thought dyslexia doesn't exist at all. And the reason he says that is because uh, there's no way, he says, of distinguishing between the reading problems that uh, what we'd call a dyslexic has from the reading problems that somebody would might have because they were simply not very clever. Um, they both suffer from difficulties with um, uh, matching print with the sounds of words, i.e. phonological problems, and um, uh, the treatment, as it were, the, the teaching that you need to help both classes of children is the same, namely giving them phonological um, exercises. That being the case, there's no point in uh, diagnosing dyslexia, therefore dyslexia doesn't exist. That's the sort of argument to use. Now, I think that's profoundly wrong for two reasons. One is that many dyslexics don't just have a phonological problem, um, but the other is that uh, dyslexics, dyslexia definitely does exist because it is has these genetic, uh, or, uh, immunological and nutritional uh, causes. And um, it would be madness to say just because, um, uh, for instance, high blood pressure um, is uh, continuous with normal blood pressure, well, that high blood pressure doesn't exist. Um, it's, it would be just absurd. Uh, dyslexia also carries with this a lot of non-reading problems. For instance, most dyslexics have problems with sequencing things. They have problems with the, when they're young with remembering the order of the days of the week or the months of the year. They have problems with uh, remembering the sequence of numbers, particularly if they have to repeat them backwards. They have problems with knowing their left from their right. As I said earlier, they have problems very often, allergies, eczema, hay fever, and so on. All those things mean that dyslexia is not just a literacy problem, it's what we call a neurological syndrome, and it involves a, the whole nervous system, actually, because these magnocells are uh, impaired in their development all over the nervous system. So it definitely does exist. Now... Um, there is another political reason for Judy Nellett's point of view, which I have more sympathy with, and that's what really now amounts to a scandal. That is to say that middle-class parents can buy, almost buy, the diagnosis of dyslexia um, by paying enough money, whereas if you're not very well off, um, it cost a, the the state schools are very reluctant to diagnose dyslexia because uh, they have very little facilities, very, very little resources to direct at dyslexia. Uh, but if they do diagnose dyslexia, then they are, by law, bound to provide certain things such as, for instance, um, free computers. Uh, and that costs money, so they're not willing to diagnose dyslexia. Um, that means, by the law of unintended consequences, that actually it's the middle class people who get these uh, computers and so on uh, because their parents can afford to get them diagnosed with dyslexia, when actually I would have said it was the working class kids who need them more. Now that is a good reason for... for um, uh, tightening up the diagnosis or changing the way in which we view the diagnosis, it is not a reason for supposing the di diagnosis doesn't exist. There's a problem that's arisen recently, which is that the definition of dyslexia has changed. Um, in the old days, well, up to about uh, five or ten years ago, it, the definition involved a discrepancy, that is to say, um, if a child, child's Indeed. reading was well below what you'd expect from their general intelligence, 
then they would be, could be classed as dyslexic, and that used to be the gold standard. But that's been abandoned for various reasons. Um, and it, it, it's now the case that people think that children are dyslexic when their reading is lower than it should be for their age, independent of how intelligent they are. And this makes... This it relates to the problem that Julian Elliott was talking about, in that um, if you say that anybody whose reading is below um, what they should, what it should be for their age, you're going to be include people whose reading is low because they're not very intelligent, um, and that, um, to me, is madness. But it, it's politically driven because um, oh, it's, it's a combination of politically and, and theory driven. The point being back to the one that Julian makes, that is to say that there's no phonological difference between dyslexics, as we would define them, and poor readers that... We used to be called garden variety poor readers, i.e. poor readers who were poor because they simply weren't very bright. The, wor the worst problem from my point of view is it means that if you are very bright and yet your reading is normal for your age, when it should be well ahead of your age, you can't be defined as dyslexic. And that is, the, to my mind, a, a tragedy because actually um, children who are very bright and yet can't read are the ones who are the most upset by it and get the most distressed and lose their self-confidence more. To be honest, I don't particularly care whether people are called dyslexic or not because it's really quite arbitrary where you draw the line between good reading or normal reading and dyslexia. What's important is that people should understand why children find it difficult to read. And my plea would not be to um, increase the amount of money for dyslexics, but rather to increase the amount of money to teach um, teachers how to recognise the signs and how to cope with them, how to help children.